Here it goes. I've been wanting to share my story for a while now, but had to gain up the courage to talk about it. It really shook me up, and though it's been a few years now, I'm still affected by it at times, and keep thinking how lucky I am that he didn't choose me. I'm a regular social media user, primarily in the art and music communities. And this is where it all started, online in early 2014. My favorite community I shall call Greensplat, who I had been a member of for a few years at that point, was my favorite spot to post art and share music to other individuals who shared the same interests similar to my own. For privacy reasons and concerns, my account was set to private and only accepted fellow splatters, who were members of the site, could view my own personal page. I learned early on there were a lot of creeps and weirdos on the net, and filtered out as many by keeping my splatter group small. Aside from a few, most conversation was kept in public viewing that I had with most members. A few splatters were an exception and I chatted with them on private chat from time to time. But then he popped up, I had recently added this new splatter to be able to view my content on my page. He had passed my filter, and unless he started to give me an alarm, he seemed okay to have on there. He privately messaged me, and we started talking about the community which lasted for over an hour. I guess you can say we hit it off. It was then after that, we started messaging each other a little more every day. We didn't know each other's name or faces since we didn't have that information shared online, but after some time, a few months of talking, we exchanged names and decided to have a Skype conversation. That was the first time I saw him, through a webcam. He seemed normal enough. I learned that he was currently living in Missouri, but had moved from the UK and was originally from Florida. I marveled at the fact that he lived in the UK before, since I had never left the country myself and had only really stayed in my state, Texas at that point in my life. Skype became a regular thing, not every day, but at least once or twice a week for several months. I learned more about him, his interests, his job, his roommates, Ferguson and all the riots since he lived not too far in St. Louis when they were happening. I learned about how when he lived in the UK, he got deported back to the US after a breakup with his girlfriend and his visa expired. He said he lost everything, everything he acquired there was gone. He was at a total loss and was rebuilding his life, sharing an apartment with a guy he knew. He sent me a picture once of a woman he said was a really good friend of his and one of a little girl he said was his daughter who was back in Florida. We carried on casually, I ended up opening up to him a lot because at the time, I was going through a loss of my younger brother who had passed the year before and a transition spiritually. We talked about that a lot and he seemed to offer comfort that I felt at the time was genuine. I felt like I developed a real friend of sorts. Later, towards the end of the year though, our video chats became less and less. Until one day he disappeared completely. No more Skype, no more on our communities, no more messages, just gone. In truth, I did feel a little sad just because we talked well and he never said he was leaving the art community or said goodbye. I had grown accustomed to talking to him at least two times a week. He had always said he hated where he was and that he wanted to leave, go somewhere new, somewhere different. He even said a few times, maybe he should come down to Texas and meet me, he thought we would hit it off in person too. I joked back that I'd even buy him a ticket. Four months passed when out of the blue I got a message on a posting I did on my online art community from him. It's from his account, but the message is incoherent, incomplete, but a part of it calls me the B-word. It upsets me, I take him off my green splat page and message him privately one last time asking why he called me such a name out of nowhere after not talking to me for months now. He responds a few days later and says that he is too crazy and that he can't talk to me because of it. Becky use he is not good. He then says, by the way, I don't like your red hair, it looked better darker. That was the last message I ever received from him. His comment about my hair, I assumed, was because he saw me with dark hair when we used to Skype, but then when he resurfaced on my green splat months later. I had a picture of myself with dyed red hair. I will never talk to him again and banned him after those last messages. Time has passed, and it's around November 2015. Almost a year since I got those last messages from him. A lot has happened to me in my own personal life. 
I started taking therapy, getting out of an abusive relationship six months before, trying to heal completely from that, when while online, on Greensplat which I still was using just not as much except to use for therapeutic reasons of viewing art, I saw it. I mean, I saw it. I couldn't believe what I was reading and the pic attached to it that I saw staring back at me. It was him. Michael, the splatter member I had talked to for several months in 2014, his mugshot. I stopped in my tracks as I was scrolling through my feed and his pic came upon my screen. I almost didn't recognize him, but it was him. He looked terrible, but mostly frightening, dangerous, and crazy. I looked up at the caption to read, and as I did, I felt the hair stand up on the back of my neck. My skin went pale. I searched his name on Google as the splatter poster of his pic said to do, so many results and hits came in. It was true, multiple arrests, different mugshots spanning from at least a decade, fugitive on the run. After finding this out, I went back and messaged the splatter member privately who posted about Michael. She didn't say what he did on her post, but asked if anyone had any contact with him or had talked to him in the community since he had been a member to contact her. I messaged her and told her I knew him, and how I used to talk to him in 2014. That is when she revealed everything to me about his alcohol slash drug use, temper, and violence. She said that he was a career criminal on the run. He would skip town to avoid persecution for his crimes. He went to jail for drug charges, but the serious ones were acts of violence towards women. She was a victim of his and was in the process of going to court for the charges against him by her. She told me her story about how she had met him in the Greensplat art community. How they started talking casually after he just seemed to pop out of nowhere. She lived alone with her elderly mother, who she would take care of while she herself was handicapped with a medical condition. She couldn't really have a normal social life because of it, so when Michael came around, they seemed to hit it off and they started an online relationship. Eventually, Michael persuaded her to buy him a bus ticket to come stay with her in Alabama and her sick mother. He told her he loved her and took advantage of her loneliness just to ease his way inside her life and home. Once he arrived, she said that he lived with her for a few months and everything was going great. He did things around the house, was looking for work, and was nice to her and her mother. She felt happy, but only for a while until all of a sudden she said he started drinking heavily where he would become cold, distant, and silent. She said his eyes would always be bloodshot, he stopped looking for work and stopped helping around the house. He stole some things. She started seeing how he was and quickly knew she had made a mistake letting him into her home. Then one night as she was sleeping, she woke up suddenly and sat up in her bed as an eerie feeling came over. She didn't know why she felt that way and was trying to gather her sense of vision from just waking up when all of a sudden a figure jumped on top of her and tried strangling her. She broke free, ran to a neighbor to call for help. When police arrived, he was gone but she knew it was him, Michael, cause she saw his face, his eyes. He was picked up the next day and taken in on an assault and strangulation charge. It was then she herself learned of his history of extreme violence against women. After that, she told me she was going to therapy and was traumatized by the attack. When I told her the details of my interaction with him, we learned he was talking to us at the same time, as well as other women in other states. We put together that he was hunting, trying to find another woman to trick, to get close to, to lure in his trap and victimize. She told me that she had seen a picture of me because he had shown it to her and when she asked who I was, he said an old friend. I mentioned the photo he had shown to me of a woman one time, I described it and that was a picture of her. So, he showed both of us a picture of each other. Talking to her more and more and seeing the trauma she was going through, I felt guilt. I realized the time he stopped talking to me was when he went down to visit her, and that is why he went missing. I realized he was weighing his options between us and others. He mentioned coming to Texas and I joked about buying him a ticket, but for some reason he never pressured me or tried persuading me into it like he did her. Maybe she seemed easier to get to. I want to say that I wouldn't have sent him one, but what if he had persuaded me somehow, especially then I was in a vulnerable state with the death of my brother. It's scary to think that not only did I talk 
engage, laugh, share personal things with such an individual, but the fact I may have come face to face with one who would have probably tried to physically harm or even worse, kill me. Looking back, I remember one Skype chat in particular. He had been drinking while we talked. I remember at one point he had a look in his face, his eyes were bloodshot, and he grew quiet yet his face looked almost angry or rage-filled. I commented on it and he just said it was a long day. We ended the chat soon after because he almost seemed in another state, like a darkness void, which I attributed to the alcohol, but maybe it was the madness in him. The justice system failed, last I heard he was back out on the streets. I also reflected on his red hair comment to me, it was random. But I learned from the splatter poster that he had a deep fondness for red-haired women and that she had red hair. I wonder if he had something against women with that color of hair even more, like a love-hate thing. This story has a lot of build-up. So, I met this friend online the summer before my junior year of high school. I was 16. His name was Flip. We clicked pretty instantly. Our senses of humor matched up and I felt like we were really good friends. He was a guy, I was a girl, but I never really held romantic feelings. Also, I was in a relationship. When I was 16, Flip was 19. I could tell he had romantic feelings and he let me know six months into our friendship that he loved me. We didn't really have a stable friendship as he flipped out a lot and would go extended amounts of time without talking to me. He told me it was because he couldn't bear to talk to me knowing we can't be together because I was dating someone. But I now know that it was more of a control thing and he wanted to stop talking to me to make me feel like I'm missing something. He really hated women, like really, really disliked women and felt like most are just whores. He told me he felt like I was different, that I was the only true woman he's ever met. I was young, dumb, and didn't really think much of it. Our friendship was only through online like messaging and FaceTiming. Now when he went on these tangents where he would abruptly stop talking to me, he would go on Twitter and make offensive and demonizing tweets about me to people. Like awful stuff. When he came back I just ignored that stuff because he would go back to being funny and nice. So, he also had a habit of lashing out at people, taking revenge, and just making people feel like crap for fun. But, I thought I was special and that he really cared about me and would never do anything like that to me. I remember leading up to my 18th birthday, he said to me, when you're 18 you're sending me nudes. You don't get to say no. I brushed it off because I knew I wouldn't. But yeah, notice there's just this element of him wanting to dominate. Anyway, fast forward two years later. I'm now 18, a freshman in college. In October, I broke up with my boyfriend which was the same guy when I was 16 and Flip took that as an opportunity. He would tell me he couldn't bear not seeing me and that basically we have to meet or it's all over. Now I didn't really have romantic feelings for him, my love for him was platonic but I figured like, I'll try the romance. I'll try to love him romantically. I couldn't lose him. So, I impulsively bought a plane ticket to where he lives in December. My parents had no idea, and to this day I still don't know why I did this. I was going to go away on a Friday, come back on a Monday. The college I go to school in is in a city with an airport so it was easy to just Uber to the airport. This romance that I'm trying to project feels real and I genuinely felt like I loved him romantically. I was finally going to meet the guy I loved. Now leading up to the flight about one to two weeks before, I started getting cold feet. I was questioning the legitimacy of my feelings and started getting on with a guy in a neighboring university. I started catching feelings for him and kissed him a day before my flight. At that point I had already decided I didn't want to pursue Flip romantically and I figured hey, we've been friends for two years. When I get there I'll tell him I only want to stay friends. Yeah, he'll be upset, but I'm sure our friendship is worth more than that, and we'll be able to have a nice, enjoyable time together. How naive I was. I decided to go on the trip anyway, thinking that maybe seeing him would reignite that fire. Upon arrival, I realized that I did not love him, and I was no longer attracted to him. Regardless, though, he was a close friend of mine for a very long time, and whether I felt a romantic connection or not, 
I wanted to meet him for the sake of meeting him. Just how I would want to meet any internet friend. So it's time for the flight. It's very early. I remember sitting on the plane contemplating walking out. I really just wanted to leave and not return. I should have listened to my gut. I arrive, and I go outside of the terminal. I see him, sitting in his car just staring at me. Like a very malicious piercing stare. After a few moments he gets out of the car. He looks very different. It's strange because we have FaceTimed and I have seen pictures of him, but he just looks different. Kind of creepier. We hugged and sat in the car. It's awkward, I feel awkward. We made small talk and awkward jokes and at that moment I wanted to be back in my dorm. We go back to his apartment and we go up to his room. We smoke some weed and I lay down on his bed to sleep. When I wake up he's spooning me and trying to fondle me. I take his hands off and tell him to stop, then I sit up and basically unload about how I don't want him romantically, only as a friend. He just started crying and begging me to tell him I love him. I tell him I can't do that. He then stands up, drops crying, goes to the bathroom and starts lighting stuff on fire. It smells like burning paper in the bedroom now. He comes out normally and just sits on his computer and plays games without talking to me. Now the rest of the trip is just like a combination of him being kind and normal to him being completely evil. Here's some of the things he's done and said throughout the three days. He made jokes about me dying. He would pretend to hit me, like lunge at me, and get close enough and watch as I flinched. He told me he almost sent a snap of me to my mom with the geotag of his town so that I would get in trouble. He told me he almost made me sleep in the car one night. He told me that one night while I was sleeping he walked over to me and started farting on me. He kept telling me to shut the hell up when I would speak or ask questions and did it multiple times in front of his roommates too. He was trying to feel me up in bed and I kept pushing his hands away and he would keep trying and would say things like, I know you want it you're just holding back. He was calling me an idiot when I would ask questions. He served me spaghetti and told me he purposely used the moldy spaghetti sauce hoping that I would get sick. Lastly, he told me he was going to make me miss my flight home. Said he was planning to drive in the opposite direction of the airport and dropping me off in the middle of nowhere. So, basically I kept my cool and when he would tell me these things I would nod and agree and laugh with him. I was scared for my life and I wanted nothing more than to leave. So, I kind of keep it cool and I spend my time trying not to upset him. When Monday rolls around, my flight isn't until 8 p.m. Around 11 a.m., he goes downstairs to leave, and at that time I pack my bag and leave without him knowing. My plan of action is to run to the nearest shopping plaza and Uber to the airport from there. I wasn't about to Uber from his house. I'm almost to the end of the street, feeling free, when I feel two arms come up from behind and wrap around me. He's hugging me, mumbles something into my ear, and then turns around and dead on sprints back down the street to his apartment. I ran to the shopping plaza, called an Uber, and got it. I felt so much relief at that moment. I felt like I was free. I waited at the airport with nothing to do for eight hours, but it was better than being in there. I look back and I feel like an idiot. Like I should have gone to a hotel and I should have probably left, but I'm a broke college kid and I was already scared shitless being here without my parents' knowledge. After I left I blocked him on every social media outlet I have, including LinkedIn, haha. <laughs> he still has tried to contact me regularly for four months, but luckily I never ever told him my address or anything. So, online friend of two years, let's not meet again. For some background information, I live in a small apartment complex, right outside my campus, with some friends. I am also a 20-year-old girl. So, all my friends were always bashing on me for never meeting up with any boys, or going out. I had gotten sick of it. I didn't want to be the little friend who stayed home and ate pizza while my friends were out on dates with boys. So, I signed up for Plenty of Fish. Now, I'm not the type of person who would say yes to any random stranger. They had to be nice looking, they had to have plenty of photos of themselves, and we both had to have at least two common interests. 
So, with those rules in my head, I psyched myself up to join the world of online dating. Within a few days, I already had two boys I was talking to. One said he was a doctor, kind of hard to believe because he was 20, and one said he worked as a construction guy. This was much easier to believe. I didn't like that doctor guy because he was lying to me. But one day, as I was getting crap from my roommates, the construction guy, who we can call Dan, messaged me on a messaging app we were using and asked if I wanted to go out for a bite to eat. I told my roommates where I was going and who I was with, you know, all the things someone should do so someone knows if you've been abducted. I even had a check in time so that when my roommate texted me if things were good, I had to say some silly code word that meant things were good. If I responded with another code word, it meant help me get out of this. If I didn't use code words, then she would call the police for help. So, I quickly dolled myself up and got ready for my date. I put my hair up in a classy bun, leaving strips of it hanging down around my glasses. I put on a nice white blouse and some black pants, and I was ready to go. I jumped in my car and headed out to the restaurant where Dan had chosen. It was just out of my town, but it was still only a 15-minute drive from my apartment. I arrived at the restaurant and saw him almost immediately. He was wearing nice clothes and looked just like his photos. He was waiting just outside the restaurant doors for me. His eyes lit up when they saw me. He walked over to me and smiled. We chatted a little bit outside, since it was summer, and then walked inside. We ate dinner and talked about our life and things like how school was going. I got the text from my friend, but since everything was all good, I sent that code word back. Dan talked about how much he liked his job and things, and altogether, it was pretty nice. Except for one thing. Dan was boring. He didn't do anything exciting or really talk enthusiastically about anything, and it was boring. It was an average date, and I honestly didn't care to go on anymore. The next day I woke up to the feeling of my phone vibrating nonstop. I looked at it and realized it was vibrating so much that it had fallen off my dresser. I almost laughed. Then I saw all the messages from Dan. At first, they were all saying how much fun he had had and that he would really like to go out again. But then the messages took a turn. They got violent and angry that I wasn't responding. It was 7 in the freaking morning. I was sleeping. I noped out of that situation. I texted him back and said I had been sleeping and that no, I was not going on any more dates with him. I was just about to block his profile on both sites when I got a final message. He said and watch your back. At first I was really creeped out, but then I thought that since I had him blocked and all my accounts were deleted he could do nothing. Wrong, later that day I saw a text from a random number telling me how pretty I looked in my blue pajamas. I glanced outside just in time to see none other than Dan running down my road. How the hell did he get my number? I thought wearily. I blocked that number and continued what I was doing. Later that night, I fell asleep pretty early and woke up to my phone text alert going crazy. It was from the number I had just blocked earlier that day. There were dozens of messages saying how I was going to get it. I quickly showed all my roommates the messages. They all told me that I should go to the police, but since I was a stupid person, I didn't. I blocked the number again and went back to sleep. But once again, I woke up to my phone buzzing. I didn't wait. I jumped in my car and drove all the way down to the police station. Once there, they told me that they couldn't do much to help me and just told me to block the number. I did. At least I had it on record. Nothing happened for a few days. The number stayed blocked on my phone for a while. But then the pictures started. There were pictures of my house, of me in my house, my car, and me at my job. I went back to the police and finally, I was able to get a restraining order against Dan. I never received any messages from Dan again after that. I now never ever use dating websites. So Dan, let's hope we never meet again. If anyone has any tips on staying safer, please let me know.